All right. Welcome, everyone. This is Community Conversation for May 2021. Uh, I am athens Clark County Mayor Kelly Gertz, and I will be joined on today's Community Conversation by two stalwart members of the Athens community, uh, Brandy Anderson of Acceptance Recovery Center and Shane Sims of People Living in Recovery. And if you have been paying attention to the vocabulary thus far, you may notice that recovery has been used twice and will be used many times throughout this program because we're going to be talking today over about the next half hour about the Athens recovery community um, because both my guests today have been fantastic members of what I think is an ever-evolving community and certainly a community that here in 2021 looks very different than what you may have thought of the recovery community as looking 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. Um, I, I was at a, a, a recent event uh, hosted by Acceptance Recovery, and I think I noted uh, that the very first recovery community thing that I was ever directly involved in was helping a friend's younger brother in the late 1980s and attending uh, a Narcotics Anonymous meeting uh, with that young man. And I remember the uh, the thickest smoke I've ever been part of. And I'm a live music fan, so I've been in a lot of late night places with thick smoke, but this is the thickest and the worst coffee I've ever had uh, in, in, in the dingy basement of a church in Norfolk, Virginia Beach, Virginia. And that is so different than today's recovery community. And so we're going to get into talking about that. Uh, and what I've asked both Brandy and Shane to begin with, um, to humanize the conversation around recovery is just to highlight a, a recent success. And of course, sometimes your biggest successes arise out of your biggest challenges. And, and so Brandy, welcome to the program. We're going to get a little bit more into your individual story, but as somebody who is such a great uh, supporter in this community, what's a recent recovery success that you have seen and experienced? Sure. Thank you, Mayor Gertz. And I was sitting here, I'm sitting here at our Women's Center location. It's located on Prince Avenue. And I can recall that was the first time I ever met you. And we, you came here in 2019 uh, for our open house. I was a little concerned that nobody would show up for a recovery event, uh, ribbon cutting. However, we had more people packed into that house than we could, that we can fit. We all had to step outside on the front lawn. And I can recall in the very beginning stages of opening up the Women's Center and thinking of the strategic plan of exactly how we were going to process these ladies into the program and the sort of care that we were going to deliver. And we had set for the next day for two women to process into the program. Well, little did we know um, how much the, the open house had spread through the community. A woman showed up on our doorsteps that was unexpected. And so we said, okay, let's, let's go ahead and do the intake assessment, see if we have the sort of programs to meet her needs. And, and we did find through that assessment that we did. Well, she was processed into the program that day. Um, she later became our, our first woman alumni. And in the beginning of last year, we were in the midst of a pandemic. And she was in a position to where her children needed to be in her care and she did not yet feel prepared to be into the community and transition into independent housing. And so our leadership got together and was like, all right, well, we want to start a, a family program, so let's do it. And so then she had her children then come live with her. She has maintained employment for um, over two and a half years now. Um, she has her children in her care. Uh, she also has got her driver's license, has secured a vehicle, and whenever her children came to be in her care, it's because her husband was in need of recovery uh, support services. I'm happy to say that her husband is now in our program and thriving. He has a very successful uh, career ahead of him. He has secured sustainable employment to not only provide for himself, but also for his family. And so when I look at um, the history of the services that we provide and the recovery community, it is about family restoration. It is about healing and community involvement. And it's through the support of 
the community and um, their courageous recovery journeys that their whole family is now has an opportunity to break the cycle of generational trauma and addiction. And so when I think of success and I sit here in, at our Women's Center location, um, she's definitely the first person that, that comes to mind and about the whole process of, of what that the recovery looks like and how it affects the whole entire family. Oh, that's that's beautiful, Brandy. And and you mentioned your, your programmatic offerings, and we're definitely going to get to that in in a couple of minutes. Um, Shane, for you, uh, in in your observation, what's a what's a great recent success that you can highlight? You know, I was listening to Brandy, and I was thinking it is it's funny and and somewhat indicative how our stories parallel. And um, my highlight actually ties directly to Brandy. Um, when I became the executive director um, here a couple of years ago, a young man came to me by the name of Jason. And um, Jason was an African-American male, young, and had been struggling with opiates and, and other substances. And he had struggled with achieving recovery. And it was mainly because he uh, he was afraid of making himself vulnerable enough to allow someone to help him. Um, he had a lot of the typical experience of young African-American males that made him um, anti-system. And no matter how the system looked, he was anti-it. And some of his family members remembered me um, from school and they had followed the work that I was doing. They recommended that he come out and talk to me. And so he came in with some ambivalence, you know, because I still represented the system. You know, I was an organization. And after a while, um, when he realized how much we had in common, when he realized that the intention of this organization was not to just process him, but actually to, to dignify him and to return his humanity to him, he bought into the idea that maybe he could get well. Um, well, he began to get well. His biggest challenge was now his girlfriend, who I think will, will probably become his wife here soon because they have so many kids together. They're, they're just forever tied together. And um, she was his biggest support system, but also his biggest hindrance. Um, she was an active addiction and she was just dead set against recovery. And I remember that she, she was bringing him to PLR, People Living in Cover, our office, for his daily groups and she would sit outside in the car and she just refused to come in. She had wanted nothing to do with it, period. And so um, I eventually invited them both to my home and we sat down and we talked about recovery. Well, eventually she bought into the idea of recovery, not because of our talk, but because of how well she saw he was doing. And it restored a level of respect for him that I, I think that they had not experienced prior to. Well, today they're both in recovery. Um, they're doing well. Jason was referred to ARC. He came through ARC where he thrived. Uh, he had his challenges, but where he thrived. And um, today they're all reunited with their kids and they have a newborn baby as well. And they've become kind of the poster children in Athens of families in recovery. And, um, and the, it was a challenge. It was a challenge and it was a great success. That's a great story, Shane. Um, one of the things you talked about in that was people who are uh, inclined to push back against any system, mm -hmm. against any program, against any formatted thing, against any institution. Uh, I mean, I'll say that in my life, in this role, I, I, I see that as kind of part of the era we're in and particularly part of people who've been under-resourced or traumatized is that, you know, they, they recognize that systems have not served them well in the past. And so any program that you're coming to them with, they immediately see you've got a name, you've got a label, you've got a program, you must be one more person who's going to fail me. Um, can each of you talk, and I'll begin with you, Brandy, about specifically what what program offerings you do have? What 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 do you do in this community in ARC and PLC? Sure, absolutely. And I don't think I gave myself a proper introduction. My name is Brandy Anderson, and I'm a person in long-term recovery. And what that means to me is in June, it will be 12 years since I have from the chains of active addiction that not only held me captive physically, but also emotionally. And I currently serve as the CEO of Acceptance Recovery Center, and I am the founder. And what sets us aside as an organization is that we were created to serve an overlooked and underserved population. And those are individuals that have some sort of entanglement with the criminal justice system, have experienced some sort of level of homelessness, 
as well as has a, a high to moderate risk and or need substance use disorder as primary need. Um, we offer cognitive behavioral interventions and so that's another thing is we are a long-term recovery residence. Um, our mission is to lead those displaced by addiction through education, care, and support into long-term recovery. And so we, we do a lot of things very different. Um, so for a long time, society had said, lock them up, throw away the key, they're bad, they can't, they don't deserve help. Um, you know, what, what research and science has said is that has not been effective. Um, so we try to target thinking systems and belief systems so that people can then change their behaviors. And we do so in a supportive environment, um, not only with licensed and certified clinicians, but also very heavily with individuals that have lived experience and are certified peer specialists. Um, we have three different programs currently. We have a men's center, a women's center, an alumni care transition program, and we also have um, intertwined in all three of those programs, a family restoration program. And it's in a long-term uh, setting. So if somebody commits to entering into our program, they're committing to a minimum of 12 up to 24 months. And we have served individuals for over three years and continue to serve them in an alumni care program if, if they have the need. Thanks for that, Brandy. And Shane, at uh, People Living in Recovery, what, what are your programmatic offerings? Yes, sir. I'll, I'll follow Brandy's step and say that my name is Shane Sims and I'm a person in long-term recovery as well. And what that means for me is that it has been a little more than 25 years since I felt the need to use any mood or mind-altering substances. And what that has afforded me is the opportunity to pay for everything that was poured into me to help me achieve recovery and to help me achieve um, the successes that I've achieved in life. Um, PLR is an organ of Recovery Community Organization, which is a peer-led organization that's designed to work hand-to-hand -hand with organizations such as ARC, um, with service board providers such as Advantage. Um, what happened to kind of spur on the creation of RCOs is that SAMHSA did a, a big study to find out why so many individuals were going into recovery, however, were, most were relapsing. And what they found over a period of time is that individuals that sustained recovery for one to 12 months had only a 33% chance of remaining in recovery um, versus individuals who sustained recovery from to up until 36 months had an 88% chance of never using substances again. And so they found that the problem was not that um, the services were not there. However, the extended support was not there. And just obviously, now, programs can only last so long for organizations such as Brandy and that continue to support that continue to support. It will rely more upon um, community support and that support network that individuals have. And so the federal government sent down a lot of money to begin to fund RCOs, which are organizations that are manned by individual lived experience as well as training. And our organizations are designed to establish lifelong relationships with individuals that comes to us. So the bane of our organization is peer recovery support. And that is that emphatic support that says, hey, I can relate. I've been there. Let's see what it is that you need. And then if you need higher level of care, we refer them to like ARC and offer assistance with admission fee. Or some people only need just that that empathetic support in which in which case we offer support groups every day. Um, from 11 to 12 o'clock Monday through Friday and on Saturday from 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock. Um, other than this, we act as kind of referral source, um, kind of as a, as a clearinghouse for individuals that needs help. We will help them identify what are their challenges to recovery, what are their needs, and to come up with a recovery plan. And as of late, we've been dealing more with the homeless population ourselves because we're currently housed at Advantage. And being in the midst of the homeless population has helped us identify another need, and that is the need for financial assistance when getting into recovery. Because obviously, if you're homeless, you don't have the resources to pay entry fees. And so we've been able to identify grants that can help us to offset those costs with individuals that are going to recovery. So we don't have uh, like an A, B, and C. We, we do everything that's necessary to help an individual achieve long-term recovery. That's great, Shane. Um, th thanks for explaining that. And, and of course, both of you mentioned that uh, you were in recovery yourselves. You talked about the importance of lived experience. Um, obviously, a lot of people are in recovery and 
go on to become a certified professional accountant, get a law degree, um, open a restaurant, you name it. Both of you made the decision to support other people in their recovery journeys. Um, Brandy, talk a little bit about that decision. I mean, I have found you a vibrant, creative person who is willing to uh, fight tooth and nail to make a thing happen. And you could make anything happen. You, 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 I, I have no doubt if you wanted to start a punk rock band, you could do that right now and you'd be playing in front of 10,000 people, but you decided to give back to the recovery community to talk, talk about that decision. Sure. Absolutely. It's a fantastic question and, um, not, not asked a lot. And so my, my work in the recovery community came from a place of a person needing help. I'm a person that's needed help before, um, there was options there, but, but not the kind of options that really set me up for success. Um, I'm a person that, um, dropped out in the eighth grade. And so there followed suit a lot of, um, um, behaviors that led me into incarceration and into my own, uh, drug addiction at a very, very young age. Uh, I put myself through college while I was in prison. And whenever I got out of prison, I had no job experience. I had no driver's license and not really a whole lot of hope that I was going to have anything different than what I had had before I went to prison when I was just 21 years old. I did, however, have uh, the drive to succeed. And so I found myself into my first job. I got a driver's license. I got back into college to finish um, my undergraduate degree. It was there that I found that, um, this is after getting a GED and working on a minor in business, I changed my degree into uh, human services. And it was there that I had the vision to help people. I wasn't sure if it was going to be the at-risk youth or be the, um, the recovery community. And what I found was that I was not really in my wheelhouse to, to work with the at-risk youth at that time. And I found a passion at working with those that were in the same position that I had been and that needed, needed a hand offered out instead of a cold shoulder. Um, I, I don't think that necessarily that I really chose the recovery community to, to work for. I think that just like Athens chose me, I think that I was chosen to work in this field I believe that my lived experience is not in vain because I have the opportunity to help others through the hardships that I face, through the struggles and through the challenges that I'm able to use that experience to be able to help others professionally instead of doing this as as volunteer work or as just a, a way to do outreach, I'm able to do this as a career. And it's um, through this career that I've, I've found my position in life and, and how to um, break the cycle of generational uh, trauma, not only in my own personal life, but in the lives of so many others. Thank you for that, Brandy. Uh, and, and, and similarly for you, Shane, you, you know, you could be doing a thousand things. You could be you know, running a business as a general contractor, you name it, but, but you've decided to give back to, to this community. Talk a little bit about that decision. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I, I began to speak about my own addiction, or my own usage of drugs. Um, as most of us know, and some of it, some of us have experienced the crack cocaine epidemic that swept through this country during the early to late nineties. Um, it devastated not just families, but entire communities. And um, for me, my story probably start when at a very young age, at probably the most impressionable and vulnerable age, um, I discovered that my own family was not immune to this. Um, and I discovered that my own parents had become addicted to crack cocaine. And me, my drug addiction was not so much experimenting with drug as it is me gravitating towards it as a way of escape. Um, when I discovered my own parents' addiction, I became, and of course, this is in hindsight, I understand this timeline, but I came rebellious, you know, and I came rebellious to get everything that was established because it was as if my, my belief in life, my belief in just humanity was destroyed at an early age. Um, and so I began to use marijuana and alcohol. And looking back, there was just this, this perfect time frame of destruction. Um, 
at the age of 13, I my first youth, age of 14, I was a father. Age of 15, I was pretty much out on my own and trying to find my way. You know, I wanted to go anywhere except back home. Um, by the age of 16, although I still managed to kind of fight my way through school, I had a totally different social circle. And at the age of 18, I was sentenced to life plus 15 years in prison for accessory to felony murder and um, robbery. Um, that definitely relates to my drug usage and the company that I chose to keep. Um, finding myself in prison for, with such a serious charge and no matter how minor my involvement was in actual death of an individual, um, just the idea that a decision I made contributed to death of an individual, it, it devastated me, but in a good way. You know, I always say that, you know, the ground has to be torn up and tilled in order for new things to be planted. And that, that's exactly what happened. And so I went into the prison system and I reverted back to my, my Christian roots, you know, those principles, those values and soon developed a reputation in prison as being the kind of the counselor, the go-to guy, you know, the, the, the inmate talk to person. And what I learned is that with a life sentence, you, you don't have an end to look forward to. You know, you don't, you can't say, well, in 10 years, I'll make parole and I'll be home. Life sentence means life sentence. And so instead, what I focus on each and every day, and I begin to give myself to people, and in the process of giving myself to people, I was able to not just um, take my attention off myself, but also to remedy some of the traumas and some of the hurts within myself. And I developed a passion for that. And that passion ultimately led to the building of a reputation that spread it throughout the prison system. And um, after only 20 years, and I say only 20 years relatively, um, three different prison wardens had petitioned the parole board for my release, and I came home in 2016 to my family. And one of the things that was ingrained in me was that, you know, you, you live life by aiding others, by assisting others. And so I came home and began to volunteer in the community. And the thing that got me into the recovery community specifically was that I was invited to do a graduation speech at the Day Report Center. Then after completing the speech, the director was like, man, we need you to work here. And so he told me, he said, the only thing you have to do is get care certified, which is a uh, certified addiction recovery empowerment specialist. And he was like, once you finish this seven day training, you know, let me know and I'll hire you on. And so I took the training and upon completion of the training, um, not only did he offer me a job, but I also got a call the very same day. Um, to work at PLR, at People Living in Recovery, for uh, substantially more money, <laughs> more money. And um, but because of my loyalty, I spoke with him and told him what the situation was, and he said, "By all means, man, you go with what's best for you." And that's how I began to work in the recovery community. And um, and I just live by the motto that we're only as great as our most sincere effort to make this world a better place. And um, there's nowhere in no circumstances a situation that I can manifest this better than working with people who are broken just like I was and letting them know that, hey, there is hope and you can't get better no matter what your circumstances or situations were or are. Thanks for sharing that, Shane. I really appreciate your honest acknowledgement, both of you, and uh, certainly reflect on both of your stories having begun in childhood. Um, you know, your, your, your journeys didn't begin as a 20 year old who got mixed up with some stuff in college. It was much earlier than that. Um, and certainly, you know, it's my observation that the recovery community has evolved a lot in recent years. Um, Brandy, what, what do you see kind of having happened over the last several years of your engagement in the recovery community? How, how do you, how do you identify this moment in recovery community culture? Sure. So I, um, I got into recovery at, in those rooms that you spoke about with the thick smoke and terrible coffee and what was told to me in my early recovery and it was what I, I needed absolutely at the time was um, to remain anonymous. And so for me, that's further confirmed shame around addiction and recovery. And so when I broke my anonymity is whenever I found my power to use my voice, my recovery story, my lived experience to share about the hope and the gifts that recovery does offer. Um, and not only was I able to find my own place in the community, I'm able to advocate for the others that are entangled in the criminal justice system. I can recall a 
a local judge that comes out to help with us on um, Martin Luther King Day of Service. Um, and he comes out and he rolls up his sleeves and he helps us do yard work and it's cold outside. And, you know, we're able to have some really great conversations and he even brings his family to come hang out with us as well. And um, he says, you know, whenever you showed up in Athens, you know, for so long, I didn't even know that the recovery community was here. And now you make it look glamorous because you're knocking on our door, you're asking to talk about recovery, you're sharing other people's recovery messages and stories. And so that's something that's changed tremendously is just the ability to, to share recovery journeys. And now not only am I able to share my own recovery journey, but I'm able to help other people find their space, their place in the recovery community to help them find their voices so that they can too share their stories. Thanks, Brandy. Shane, how would you identify the difference in today's recovery community versus 15, 20 years ago? Yeah. Well, I've, I've, I have the, the unfortunate fortune of having lived in kind of a time capsule for a while, then returning back to Athens. And, um, and the, the, it was instant. I mean, the impression that it made upon me how I would say progressive Athens is, and I don't mean that in political sense, but how progressive Athens is in addressing the real issues of life. Um, it struck me instantly. Um, when I was incarcerated in 1995, um, it, Recovery wasn't a thing that was talked about. Addiction definitely was here, but it was hidden under the shadows of UGA and all the other great things that was happening in Athens. And coming back, I learned that Athens is actually considered the recovery capital of Georgia right now. And I thought that was an awesome thing. So in Athens, we, we've made strides and me now working in recovery for a little more than three years, um, I have the benefit of a broader perspective and dealing with other organizations in other areas. And I, I mean, I take my hats off um, to Athens and what Athens has achieved by way of helping people to rebuild their lives. Um, but what I also see is that there there is still some need and the greatest need right now is for recovery to be marketed to people um, who are in the most desperate need of recovery. And that is the, the underprivileged and that is the poor. And, and I think Brandy and ARC is making awesome strides in that area to diversify the face of recovery and to make recovery available you know, for, to a more diverse group of people. But that is being done. So I don't speak on that as if it's something that's not being addressed. It is being addressed. And I think now that this is what a recovery community is gravitating its attention towards is making sure that recovery is available to everyone. Thinking a little bit about this moment in time, um, I, I would identify that everybody has had some level of trauma over the last year, you know, whether, whether that's losing people you love and care about or f feeling like you've been unchained from the things that you enjoyed for so long that you, you were tied to, whether it's school or community or work or normalcy. Um, there's been a lot in the national press about sales of alcohol going through the roof. Um, and and for either of you, what what reflections do you have about the challenges for people in recovery and the recovery community through through this pandemic of the last fifteen months? So what we found at the beginning of the pandemic is um, we implemented shelter in place um, in Athens quicker than much of the state did, and. Um, before it was even announced by the governor and our residents, they trusted us. They trusted our leadership. Um, they just trusted our decision making, even though they were being told they couldn't leave property and they couldn't see their families. Um, we found more community within our residents that were in our care during the beginning. But then as time went on, one of the biggest components um, of recovery is connection. And so what we found is our residents were, and even our Athens overall, the recovery community was craving connection. Um, we found creative ways to be together without being together, you know, the um, Zoom platforms and online meetings increased. And so 
recovery um, support groups are more accessible in that way today than they were before. But as far as those that are in need of care, we've seen those numbers skyrocket. Our phone rings off the hook so much that we had to implement a new phone system just to try to keep up with the calls that we were receiving. Um, those that are providing care, what we have realized is that compassion fatigue has skyrocketed as well because we're we are our our work outflow is higher than ever. Um, us pouring ourselves into other individuals is higher than ever. And Shane mentioned earlier before we logged on about the need for self-care. And so our organization has implemented self-care contracts for all of our team members so that we can hold ourselves and hold each other accountable so that we can continue to provide services because mental health needs um, I don't know the statistics has uh, is more of an epidemic than the pandemic was and continues to be. So we're, we are dealing with the aftermath of isolation and um, not being able to connect with, with other humans in a way to where we're able to sit in the same room with somebody. And Shane, you mentioned earlier being very engaged with the homeless community right now and, I witnessing on the street and, and talking with some of those individuals who I know, I identify this is a really tough time for them. And I imagine that recovery opportunity is challenging in a different way today than maybe it was 18 months ago. Yes, sir. Um, it, it is very challenging. And um, I was thinking as Brandy was speaking, there's a, a popular saying that goes um, recovery is the opposite of recovery is the opposite of isolation. Um, in other words, connection, as she said, it is absolutely essential. And what we deal with is also dual diagnosis is that majority of the people that we treat here or that we deal with here, um, they're diagnosed with a mental health condition as well as substance use. And they're both intricately entwined, intertwined with one another. And unlike Brandy and ARC, we were unable to shelter in place because the services we provide individuals come to us. And as I said, by 80 percent of the individuals are homeless. And so when it got to the point that the pandemic uh, made us take extra measures and to close down the office early or to close it down altogether some days, um, they were there at the door um, when we would come back and waiting, you know, and sometimes it's two or three days on end. And so it's become hard because we were able to build up a level of trust with the homeless population that's not easy to build up. And when they began to see our doors were finally closed, it, it tore into that trust. And they felt like this is just another organization that's going to fail them at their most needy times. And so we as staff, we got together and we told the board, look, we're, we're willing to take the risk to be here. We're going to implement the CDC guidelines and do everything extra that we can. And so about mid pandemic, I guess you can say if if there was ever a point. Um, we began to uh, just commit ourselves to being here, being present, even if it meant only one staff member here at a time and trying to do social distancing. Um, but we realized that we had to get ahead of losing the trust of this population. Otherwise, you know, the chances of them trusting enough to even receive services was going to be slim to none. So that challenge, I think we met head on. And I think that we kind of got ahead of things on that. And, um, and it was difficult, but we're still navigating it because it exacerbated a lot of the mental health conditions. And then, you know, the lack of services or a fewer services, it, it created kind of a, a scare, a fright amongst the homeless population. And so our work was to counter that and to provide this safe and sober place for them to come to. So it's been a challenge, but I, I think that by the grace of God, we've, we've met that challenge to the best of our abilities anyway. So thinking about navigation, the last thing I'd like to ask each of you to reflect on is what's the road ahead look like as we navigate the next couple of years, the next period of time in the Athens recovery community? In, in your beautiful vision of what we're going to see, um, Brandy, what, what, what will the next two years hold? Yeah, so, you know, <laughs> given the past year and a half of not being anything that we expected, it's you know, and, and 2021 has been increasingly more difficult. I can remember just thinking if we can just get through this pandemic to where we can open up and regather. And what I've found is um, anxiety 
for people that have not experienced anxiety before is, is also through the roof as people do not know how to engage with other people anymore and trying to learn, relearn new, um, mannerisms and, and how to even just go out to have lunch with somebody, you know, do I wear my mask? Do I not? Can I shake hands? Do we elbow bump? Um, you know, when is it appropriate to take my mask down? Um, can I hug? Um, a lot of the recovery community, there were big huggers. So um, it, I'm really uncertain what it's going to look like overall. But what I hope that it will look like is that we are able to find ways to be together again, that we're going to find ways to celebrate and have symposiums and have recovery events where we're able to invite community partners to be a part of and we're able to continue to spread awareness, um, share people's recovery stories, um, engage the other communities that maybe haven't heard about recovery, um, don't know what it looks like, don't know that it's possible, and so that they can share the message of hope and recovery as well. Um, for Acceptance Recovery Center, we're upon a new Independence Day to where we're going to be in, in properties that that belong to us. Um, and so we're going to we're going to find out what that looks like. We moved um, a 60 bed program through the end of 2020 and into 2021. And so we're looking at what that looks like for us and being in a, a different location for a men's center program. So um, the road ahead, what I hope that it looks like is that. Um, we're able to continue providing services, that PLR is still able to outreach into the homeless community, continue to build those partnerships and those relationships, um, that we're able to all work together collectively to help people find recovery, um, the overlooked and underserved populations, um, the poor and the underprivileged, as, as Shane so um, vulnerably spoke of, that we're able to find a way to support um, them as well as, um, you know, just being able to spread awareness so that whenever somebody does see that somebody might need help, that they will not turn a shoulder to them, but say, hey, what happened to you? And is there something I can do to help you? And that we can figure out how to help help those those individuals that are in need of recovery support. And Shane, in our last couple of minutes, <laughs> same question of you: what what picture would you paint of the next couple of years in the recovery community? Well, I'll, I'll be honest. I share Brandy's initial sentiments that um, COVID it, it tore into our ability to to visualize or to have vision because it was so unexpected and it devastated so much for our organization. It even posed a challenge without funding. Um, there was one point during COVID that we had lost all funding and we had to advocate at the state capitol to get that funding restored. And so right now it is just um, recovering, recoup recouping. But what my hope is for the future at this point is that there'll be a greater collaboration between service providers, organizations and institutions and um, to provide this, this system of care that will work and be sustainable during times like this. And that will also be there for the most vulnerable individuals, because we saw that. You know, the bottom of the totem pole, totem pole were those vulnerable individuals, the homeless populations, you know, the population that are generally or historically underserved. Um, they receive pretty much the crumbs off the plates of the rest of us that are more well established, that found some benefits, even some benefits during COVID. And so my hope is that we establish a system of care that reaches all the way down to the bottom, that doesn't fail whenever we as a country or, or as a community um, go through challenges. And so right now, what we're working on at PLR is establishing greater collaborations, communication between the courts, service providers, um, other nonprofit organizations, uh, so that this infrastructure is in place if and when this type of situation happens again. Well, d despite the challenges of this year, um, both of you have been such great partners in this community. I'm really lucky to be able to share a screen with you. And all of Athens is uh, is lucky to call you members of our community. Um, can't wait to see what you are going to do next. And um, everybody out there in the public, I, uh, I ask you to look uh, online for People Living in Recovery, where Shane Sims is director, and Acceptance Recovery Center, uh, and the great work of Brandi Anderson and her team. Y'all be safe. God bless.